So um, let's kick it off. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Guillaume de Bourren. I'm a board member of the Incap, Incap, Impact Capital Forum. Uh, for those of you who are joining one of our events for the first time, uh, Impact Capital Forum is a nonprofit and a platform uh, aiming at um, advancing the impact investing, social entrepreneurship, and sustainability um, space by creating uh, meaningful conversations uh, and uh, providing some thought leaderships around those different topics. We host uh, a number of events, whether in person, like uh, the event we had about 10 days ago during Climate Week in New York, as well as um, uh, webinars like the one we have today. Uh, and we have a, a membership of roughly 2,500 members in the US, outside the US. Uh, and so we're very excited to uh, host this event today, uh, fo focusing on um, impact investing in uh, Africa uh, and the uh, sub Sub-Saharan sub uh, continent. We've had a couple of events in the past, uh, roughly about a year and a half, where we, we had also a panel of uh, practitioners to talk about the impact of the pandemic uh, on the sector in Africa. And today, we're very excited to uh, introduce the distinguished panel of, uh, of practitioners in the field as well. You'll see in different areas uh, covering final, financial inclusion, uh, gender smart investing, um, green growth, as well as uh, uh, smart agriculture and uh, food. And I think the, the purpose of this panel is to uh, look at the state of um, impact in investing in um, Africa at the moment. What are the current drivers fueling the growth? Why are um, a lot of capital flows now going to Africa? And have our panelists sort of walk through some of the projects and some of the, some of the initiatives that they're working on um, to kind of like give you a, a general overview. And um, also hopefully uh, we'll have time to at the end to, to get questions from our uh, registered attendees. And if there is interest to pursue the conversation after the fact with some of the, the panelists will also be happy to you know, facilitate that. Uh, that being said, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Sibon Guillet, who's going to be mo moderating the event. Um, so Sibon Guillet, I'll ask you to start to, uh, by introdu introducing yourself, and then uh, maybe I'll, I'll let you uh, ask each of the panelists as well, other panelists to present themselves quickly, and then we'll go over uh, the rest of our discussion. But uh, first and foremost, thank you all very much for attending and, and making the time to, to join this ICF event. Sibongile, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you, Job, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, and good day and good evening, depending where you are in the world. Um, my name is Bongile Zulu, and I represent Capital Unlocked. We specialize in impact investing, um, advisory, as well as uh, fund management. And we are predominantly rooted in the food, agriculture, and manufacturing sectors. And uh, currently, we operate in South Africa. And I'm really pleased to be part of this panel. Um, and I look forward to engaging with my fellow peers as well in impact investing and highlighting recent developments in financial inclusion, climate risk, gender lens investing in sub Saharan Africa, as you have stated. Um, and it would be great to see um, some of the cross cutting themes um, that affect. Um, I see different parts of uh, the continent. We've got representation from West Africa and South Africa. And I think it will be great to actually hear from the panelists about how their own experiences of um, impact investing, um, what's working, what's not, where the opportunities are, and how their own organizations are actually helping to close some of the gaps um, as they come in and the, the support that they um, is actually still needed in the space. Uh, so this evening, I'm joined by um, very well accomplished uh, individuals 
we've got Asana, Alio, and I'll let you all just uh, give a, a little bit of a, an intro yourselves. So we've got Asana, um, she represents GGGI, which is a Global Green Institute. Um, she's based out in, in Senegal. Then we've got Maya Bernie, and she's the partner, associate partner at Kelly Capital, and she's the founder of Womvest, um, with a V, based in South Africa, and Bernie Akbaria, and he is the CEO of Ma Tonight in um, Senegal. So I'd like to maybe start um, with uh, Asana. Maybe you can also just give a bit of an introduction, and then we can delve deep into the conversation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sibongel. Um, as a well said, my name is Asana. I'm the country representative for the Global Green Growth Institute based in Senegal. Uh, focusing uh, on green growth strategies and accompanying the government of Senegal achieve its uh, green strategies in terms of objectives, but also the policy and uh, green investments and climate financing. Uh, so I would stop there and I will let uh, uh, my fellow mates uh, on the call join and uh, hand it over. So I will hand it over to uh, Maya. Thanks, Asana. It's really great to be here. Um, so I'm based in Johannesburg. My background's in the private equity space. Spent the past sort of six years in private equity and transitioned into impact investing with a particular focus on gender lens investing. Um, it's very interesting what's happening on the ground here uh, in terms of looking at innovative deal structures and fund level structures that incorporate impact incentives um, and as well as financial return. So that's a space that I'm very intrigued by and a space that I'm in. Um, I have two capacities, one at Calio Capital that Sibon Gire mentioned as an associate partner, and then also as a founder of Wombest, which is a network and alternative investment platform for um, financing women-led businesses in South Africa. And I'll hand over to Bernie. Hello everyone, my name is Bernie Akwarai. I'm the uh, CEO of Matontin. Matontin is a um, digital financial services platform. We provide access to small loans and a range of financial services to financially excluded, mostly women in the Francophone um, area of Africa. Um, the, we're trying to solve a very complex problem that we find, especially in our region of Francophone West Africa, which is how do you provide access to financial services to women who don't have smartphones, are not financially literate or literate in any, uh, in any case. And um, on the other hand, we also have a situation where financial services providers cannot easily provide um, financial services to these women. They live far away from the branch. They don't have the right business model to do that, the right platform or technology. And so we bring both of these people together on our platform we digitize the women who are typically are members of savings groups and credit score them so they can be eligible for financial services. And then we provide the financial services providers, the banks and the MFIs, an end-to-end -end platform with a range of tools, um, credit scoring, digital payments, so they can provide services to these women, provide loans directly to these women's um, digital wallets. So that's what we do as a company. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Great, great, lovely to have you here. So Bernie, maybe we'll start with you um, with regards to you know, um, the space of financial inclusion and what are the specific things that are standing out for you where, which are actually attracting capital? And do you believe that they're the ones that actually need um, capital the most? Yeah, so I think out there in my region, and I think it's very important to, sta start, uh, to state from the, from the start, that Africa is very um, region specific. Um, so what's going on in East Africa is very different from what's going on in West Africa and what's different from going on in South, Southern Africa. And then even within West Africa where we live, Anglophone countries are very different from Francophone countries. So I wanna to talk today about uh, Francophone West Africa. I wanna, that's the perspective I wanna come from. And uh, when we see investing in our space, a lot of the investments, a lot of the so-called unicorns, uh, fintech companies, they're all in the aggregation and in the, um, and, the, and in the payments sector. And one of the reasons for that is because that is the sector where there is solid enough, well-defined regulation for fintech companies to be able to play within. 
And so that's where a lot of the uh, uh, investment is going into in our region. Um, but what that means though, is that a lot of the innovation around true, what I call true FinTech, which is around financial inclusion. Um, how do you uh, democratize financial services for people who are financially excluded? A lot of that is missing capital. And to be fair, one of the reasons for that is we don't have good regulation to enable that happen. Yep, um, and then just uh, Maya um, uh, and, and the sun actually, when it comes to this the area that of gender lens investing and um, climate smart uh, technologies, and what are you seeing in your space? I mean, we've heard quite a bit of noise and uh, communication around opportunities in, in gender lens investing and, and, and climate uh, related initiatives. Um, but what do you see um, on the ground and what do you think um, is getting support and where, where are, are the gaps um, coming through? And maybe Maya can go first and then Asana. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting opportunity for, for anyone interested in backing uh, women-led businesses or let's just say businesses that have women as the key beneficiaries of their products and services. I think a lot of capital is being raised at the fund level. Um, DFIs and other institutions are recognizing that uh, investing in women is not just a good financial, it, it doesn't make only a good financial uh, case, but it can also make an impact case. So that it ticks quite a few boxes. Um, and the business case is being made for investing in women right now, which is very exciting. Um, you know, what we're seeing on the ground, I mean, there was a stat that came out by the World Bank recently that said for every one dollar invested in a woman led startup in Africa, twenty five dollars are invested in a man. And that stat is actually better than it has been historically. Um, there's still quite a gap, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, people are recognizing that opportunity is being left on the table by not seriously considering investing in half of the population <laughs> and a key driver of that population uh, being women. So, so yeah, that's what we're sort of seeing on the ground there, Simon Gile. Nasana, would you like to add to that? Sure, um, I'd say for, I would take the, the Francophone and take maybe Senegal's context and say that, you know, post COVID, I would say post pandemic, in Senegal, the biggest thing we saw is there, there are multiple gaps. So what the government did initially was to focus on a $1.3 billion, uh, I would say it's more of a, the, one of the economic resilience plans for the country. And, and climate, climate change and climate impact, were, those were one of the biggest key indicators. And one of the things they started doing was, how do you make sure that there is financial and access to capital for small entrepreneurs? whether it's men or women, but I also think the, the focus was mainly on job creation. How do we leverage the institutions that are currently existing and making sure that they're sustainable? They create green jobs. While they're creating green jobs, how do we make sure that they're, they're, there's a gender component and the balance, right? You set specific goals and targets, you monitor them, and then there's duplication. Because a lot of the challenges we saw is that a lot of African countries, especially in West Africa, is that majority of the job markets or opportunities uh, to scale any entrepreneurship. It's in the informal sector. The first thing is you need to formalize them. The second thing is you need to make sure they understand that if the, you formalize them, there are some rules and processes. You need to give them the capacity building. You need to incorporate behavioral change and then prior to investing and putting capital. Because if not, when you bring in the capital, it ended up being a deficit rather than a value added. So those are some of the biggest things. Now, if we go into sectors, I would say agriculture was a big sector. Uh, FinTech was a big sector. Um, and also just capacity building was a big sector because a lot of women and children that we see in big cities ended up migrating because of the pandemic um, to rural areas. When they will go back to rural areas, they do have to go back to what cultivating or doing informal businesses. But that's not sustainable because the moment after the pandemic, everyone is going to migrate back to the overpopulated cities. So the investment has to be broken down by the different sectors. So what Senegal did is, and I'm just going to give you five key sectors where we saw a big relief and they're still ongoing. The first one is investment into climate smart agriculture, making the country more competitive, growing its own crops at the national level, 
to make purchasing powers as low as possible because the cost of food and basic services and needs are much higher. It's over the average rate in the, on the whole continent. Senegal has a high percentage in terms of cost for living. Second, it's healthcare. Healthcare was a big challenge. COVID made it even more uh, flagrant. So the government invested a huge amount of its uh, investment in this release fund into medical services and also institutions and also piloting, as you know, one of the biggest uh, post-COVID centers uh, through the, the healthcare center that led the COVID relief in the whole for West Africa. The third component we went uh, that we saw a lot was as SME financing. How do we make sure we reach a lot of SMEs that need additional capital but do not have access? In Senegal, there are about 25 to 26 certified banks. You have said to out of the 26, less than 5% are willing to give a loan to an entrepreneur who has started within the first, first five years, which is a risk, meaning most loans are giving, even small loans, right, are giving to entrepreneurs that are already existing and that are making money. Often those entrepreneurs do not need a small amounts of money. What they need now is either mergers, acquisitions, or even going straight to a fund that can make, enable them to scale. And the fourth component that we saw uh, a lot as well uh, outside of this, uh, this sector was innovation. Innovation was welcomed. Um, banks were funded uh, through the central bank where different strategies were developed for different banks to begin to incorporate SMEs that would initiate women, gen the gender component. So anything that was related to the gender balance, they would then have a much higher capacity to be incubated, to be funded, to be accompanied, and also to enable them to scale from city to city or from zone to zone. I will stop there. I wouldn't talk about the bigger projects or PPP projects or other things the government did, but I think those are the basic essential sectors we I saw personally uh, to that it drove a lot of change that also incorporated uh, the gender, the financial, the capacity building to, to enable sustainable uh, development after the pandemic. Thank you. Can I just add quickly to what Asana said there? Um, I th and I think I think it comes through in what she was saying, but to, under to sort of emphasize it, there is an intersectionality, of course, between gender and climate change. Um, and, you know, climate, I mean, there's many studies around this, that, but, but most recent ones that are coming out to show that women and girls are disproportionately affected by the effects of climate change. Um, so this is climate change itself is not gender neutral. And so there's this embedded gender component within climate change itself and these policies and investment strategies need to take that into account and consider the effects. Um, they call it a, um, a threat multiplier in that as climate change uh, causes negative effects on agriculture, et cetera, and the environment, political and social instability can arise, which actually puts women and girls at more risk um, than, than they have been historically. So just interesting to note that intersectionality. I know, Sibongile, you probably know quite a bit about this particular space, given the work that you do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but I must say that um, it sounds like the government of Senegal has got quite a, a nice comprehensive multi-pronged approach um, to addressing all these key issues, um, you know, from what has happened in, in preparation for, you know, any future pandemics and and just creating a sustainable uh, sustainable economic growth. And definitely, uh, Maya, what you refer to it when it comes to agriculture, then you have like its layers. Um, you have the access to finance, financial inclusivity, the issues that are there. Um, in the context of Africa, we also have challenges around land. And then when it comes to climate, it's also the quality of that um, the farming enterprise. If we're looking at purely um, the agricultural side of things but with, without considering the, the processing aspect. And then uh, if we talk about the, the gender aspect of it. So that's another layer. Um, and, and even more so in, 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 in the continent of, of Africa is the, the issue around youth as well, making sure that youth are well um, absorbed into the into the industries um, that they're doing jobs that are meaningful to them that they actually have earning capacity which is already challenging enough um, in, in most of the, uh, the countries on the continent and I wanted to just mention about the uh, questions um, please feel free to send questions through our Q&A section and I see there is one question that's come through uh, Jim will help with um, yeah, building okay, so that there as was well a... as we go along yeah, there is a question maybe uh, 
uh, that we can discuss right now, if that's okay with you guys. There was a, one of our attendants who was asking whether we could, you guys could give some examples of um, uh, smart agriculture initiatives that were uh, ongoing in your different countries. So I think uh, maybe starting with Asana. Uh, sure, for, for Senegal, precisely for the Global Green Growth Institute, we're working with about 1,200 uh, union farmers currently on the rice production. As you know, Senegal is the number fourth country around the world in terms of rice consumption. However, it imports uh, between, uh, if I'm not mistaken, statistics-wise, we're looking at almost 45% of import of rice. Um, you cannot be the world's fourth consumer and import majority when there is inflation. It's going to impact your entire population if that is your main source of consumption. So Senegal has been investing on making sure that the rice that is at the local market is of good value. It's at a competitive price. The local Senegalese can afford it. So in collaboration with the Qatar Fund for Development, we're looking at what we're more like a blended finance. Uh, Qatar Fund for Development will initiate a pilot and then our goal is to then scale that with the GCF uh, financing to reach about 40 million on a certain number of hectares so Senegal cannot just produce rice in country, but also export it and make the local rice competitive. And what we also do in that, the climate smart agriculture uh, section is that's just one component. We go through the entire value chain. Uh, there's a lot of women and men that work in this sector, but it's only tailored to a specific type of season. So what we're doing for the climate smart agriculture is the irrigation portion. We're making sure that it's irrigated agriculture and it's powered by solar. So we're doing solar power irrigation. Uh, that's one, to reduce the cost, to make it efficient. Um, besides the energy and the efficiency, we also wanna look at price and competitiveness. The third component is the high quality rice variety that Senegal has so that it's globally competitive and it's attractive to the consumer. So we're working with the Research Institute Africa Rice to determine which are the best varieties as well. And once those three are put together, we connect the rice producers directly with rice mills in Senegal, rather than exporting the rice to get it processed. We have local rice mills that would then process the rice, make it consumable locally. And so the next thing is that we will set up a distribution channel within the country and possibly within the region so that in a few years, Senegal will not only uh, reduce its number in terms of importation of rice, but become also a, a, a key player on the, mar on the market in terms of rice distribution. I'll stop there. Very interesting. <laughs> are, there, are there similar projects or, or um, climate smart uh, example, uh, initiatives in South Africa that uh, Sibo or, or Maya you're, you're aware of? Um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so we have a project currently where we are looking at seven sub-projects. Um, we have three uh, crop-related um, initiatives and uh, four in livestock. Um, the, the theme that we have with all of them is around um, soil health, regenerative farming, um, and traceability and, um, and and certification. So on the crop side, we have um, agricultural colleges that have been training farmers to plant from the start um, using regenerative um, practices and climate smart practices. So predominantly focusing on the soil health, making sure that, that if you create a, a rich environment from a soil perspective, um, whether you have um, issues of drought or issues of floods, um, you're actually able to protect yourself. Um, and we've experienced both in, in, in different parts of, of, of our country, other parts we have floods and other parts we have um, we have drought. And on top of that, the, the, the farmers and, and the crop side of things, they, they are encouraged to plant drought resistant uh, crops, which are our indigenous crops as well, which are really meant for this type of soil. Um, and in that, it's encouraging um, local people to eat locally grown food, which grows better anyway, which doesn't require additional fertilizers, doesn't require you to buy seeds every year. If you actually, you're able to harvest the seeds and keep them and use them. And the farmers say, there's a, it's all market led though as well. So we connect them um, with the market and they're planting what's required. And if you, when some people think about regenerative uh, 
agriculture, they always think it just be, it would be for smallholder farmers only that you can't commercialize it. But we have examples of commercialization um, on the back of regenerative farming. And then on the livestock uh, side of, uh, of, of how we do, we have uh, cattle, we have sheep, we have uh, goats, and various projects, different uh, species. But there as well, it's also using um, this regenerative approach where you're using both plants and animals and the waste from the animals. You create your own in-house fertilizers, you create your own pesticides, and you have better control over what happens on your farm. And you can actually re re regenerate soil, which was hopeless, where you thought that you would never be able to plant there, be able to feed your cattle. Um, so we've got um, those those projects that we're doing. And, and again, linkages to the markets within South Africa and within the region to, to allow um, these um, these crops or, or livestock to be able to actually be sold in other parts and be certified. So where we work uh, with um, aggregators, we, it makes financial sense to rather get them certified, whether it's for food safety, HACCP, and if it's organic certification, that way small farmers will now get access to, through the facilities that are certified, we were to have their food on shelves on, on mainstream, the mainstream retailers where before they would have just had to sell their food in the market in an open market competing with everyone else. So that's the, that's, those are the areas where we focus to say, let's take care of the soil, let's take care of the plants and animals in a regenerative approach and make sure that it also attracts good prices in the markets because it can be certified to have met the food standards and if it's organic, be able to also certify the, that. And we also help them with access to capital to grow once they start having the market and they solidify um, their presence. Thank you for that. Uh, I see that there's a question. There's a number of questions coming through the chats in the Q and A. Uh, we have, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about uh, climate smart agriculture. Maybe we should turn over to financial inclusion and uh, access to uh, financing for SMEs. Um, there's a question on the the missing middle. Uh, Bernie, I'm wondering if you can maybe uh, comment on that and and what you see from your perspective as a way to address this gap. Uh, you're on mute. Yep, sorry, can you read the question out? Uh, sure, um, just one second. Um, on supply and demand for capital, most African companies are SMEs and seek 1 million or less, while most capital providers offer investments of 1 million or even 5 million or more. What can we do to address this problem of the missing middle? Yeah, it's a really tough question. Uh, and I think a lot of that is the way the venture capital industry is structured and rewarded in our, in our and again, I want to speak about our region. Um, but I think this applies to most of Africa. I think one of the challenges for me is that we seem to have copied and pasted a venture capital model from the US into Africa. And, and I think if, in my region, especially VCs that call themselves seed capital, don't do seed capital, right? They, they, really, are, they really are series A's. And, and I think it's gonna be very difficult to do. And I think we're gonna need help from um, external forces, including government. But I think we need to recategorize that classic model of, of, of investing where we say friends and family, pre-seed, seed, because I think most of us uh, as a, um, startups in, in Africa, we're at the pre-seed stage. And if we think about it like that, then what, that, what comes with that is the fact that you need more than just money, right? You need a lot of um, support, a lot of acceleration, for you to even get to the stage where you can be a C and a Series A kind of company. And I think if we think about it like that, that would change how we approach uh, venture capital in our part of the world. And I think you would then see a much bigger explosion of startups. Right now, where you're either dealing with really, really small, inexperienced startups, or you're dealing with very, very um, solid uh, companies that are, that are, that are suited for, for aggressive growth, right? And, and, and that would be my approach 
if someone was asking my opinion, is I think we need to devote our resources and efforts more into the pre-seed kind of area and build institutions um, around that, uh, partnerships, ecosystems around that to help most of our companies close that gap. And I don't think money is going to, just money alone is going to solve that problem. Yeah, I think as Anna was mentioning, capacity building. Exactly. I think for you, for you as a, an operator of, of a platform uh, like Matontine, um, I think we, when we discussed this before this panel, you're, you're also focusing on providing beyond just access to financing, providing or helping the, your um, clients upskill, learn financial management. Maybe that's worth describing a bit more. Sure, sure. So it's a great question. So what we do is we ourselves, we, we are, we're, a, we're, a tech, we're, a, we're a digital financial services platform. So we don't lend money. We don't, um, um, we don't invest ourselves, right? So what we do is we, you, you can think of us as an intermediary where we've built this platform that enables excluded women via our platform. And then we've built all the tools and then we do that. What we've seen, though, uh, around the capacity development, like Asana mentioned, is if you just give the women money, what happens to them is they spend it recklessly, not because they're bad people, but because nobody ever taught them how to spend the money well, right? So what we do now is that as the core of what we do, we stop the financial education, right? So you, you work with that woman and teach them how to plan. Maybe I don't need to borrow. Maybe I can save enough to solve this problem that I have, right? So start with the financial education as the core of what you do. And after that, you can layer on top, not just financing, but the right type of financing for them. So sometimes it's a loan, sometimes it's savings, sometimes it's a mixture of both. And I think when you think about really micro nano kind businesses in Africa, that is the, in our opinion, the best way to solve some of that problem. Now there's a whole question around that about scaling, but that's another, another topic. Can I interject just, just a, this is a very interesting um, question about the missing middle. And I think uh, it may be different in different parts of Africa, but certainly in South Africa, what we're seeing is we have quite a developed VC space. So that is addressing the, the startup uh, ecosystem. Um, it can definitely be improved and definitely be more robust, but there seems to be a hub of VC activity happening um, in the startup space. Um, and then you have your more um, mature funds who are, you know, your $5 million plus investors, where the missing middle is that what I consider the missing middle is that is that sort of series A space that the SME is not startups, but actually SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises. Um, are trying to raise these smaller check sizes. Um, and what I've seen is that, you know, as LPs who are providing capital to funds, the fund economics doesn't work when you're writing small check sizes. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's interesting now what's happening with different fund models that are that are coming up. So where funds are actually raising at the fund level, smaller uh, pools of capital in order for them to make smaller check sizes. And so, John, I'd recommend maybe um, Google Collaborative for Frontier Finance, CFF. It's a network of these emerging fund managers who are using different types of fund structures in order to address the missing middle. Um, and one fund that's in there is called Setcha Capital, who I know very well, who are raising, um, I mean, they've done, they did one, their first fund was $5 million that was seeded by a family office. And so they made very, very small investments. They call themselves private equity, impact private equity, but their fund size was $5 million. And their second fund is now going to be $50 million. Um, and they have they have substantial traction. I think they'll have a first close by the end of the year. But it's been a hard slog because at the LP level, it's hard to go to DFIs and say, you know, yeah. fund us at $50 million. Um, and, and originally they had, they had it at 30. And I just realized that, no one was going to touch them at 30. And so they raised it to 50, but they are targeting their specific strategy is the missing middle. Um, so there's such a capital S E C H a capital. Um, it would be interesting for you to check them out. Maybe I have a follow-up question for you on that, Maya. Do you think that there are some challenges in terms of uh, assessing the credit risk, being able to, um, have access to sufficient data to, to manage risk 
that is a uh, challenge to then uh, raise more capital or, or attract more institutional investors to, to this segment? Is yeah, that look, an issue it, from your perspective? So from what I understand on the LP perspective, it just really, so first of all, they're concerned about the fund economics for the fund manager. How are, how are the fund managers being correctly aligned and incentivized and rewarded if the, if the capital is, is less than, you know, a uh, hundred million dollars yeah. like how is it sustainable um Setcha has a very interesting model where they actually blend their capital stack so they they raise um institutional capital and then they have a grant portion as well that helps to subsidize their fees basically um and that and, and that's quite interesting at the fund level um i i you know i'm not sure that data is necessarily an issue but um, but again, I'm on an LP, so I wouldn't really, really know. But it's more about return on their effort as DFIs, allocating capital, um, and whether they think that's sustainable or not. But it, it is moving slowly, I think. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Uh, I see there are more questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Go ahead. I mean, I, there was a question I wanted to, I wanted to touch about um, from Carla regarding what's worked and what hasn't worked well after spoke, focusing so much um, efforts on the uh, on gender in terms of uh, in access to capital, partner, secretary, and so on. So that's a that'd be an interesting question to to talk about um, if uh, if everyone's interested in that. Sure. So the question is, gender as a focus is not new, has been discussed in this space for the past few decades at least. Can anyone comment on the work that has been done in the past and lessons learned? What work and what didn't work? And why, why is this access to capital, partners, technology and know-how still such a challenge? So let me first of all start by giving you really good examples that have worked. I will give you two different countries. Um, one of them is in Nigeria. Um, it was a program run by Women's, uh, Women's World Banking and in conjunction with what was formerly known as um, uh, Diamond Bank has been taken over by Access Bank now. And they actually ended up reaching about a million women um, through a process of leveraging existing uh, infrastructure, so existing cultural um, 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 traditions. So basically, the women through the savings group, they use that as a, as a way to um, build credit profiles around those women to lend to them. So they're able to digitize that process, which is exactly what we do, by the way. Um, but they're able to digitize that process and lend to women in marketplaces and, and in places where they wouldn't normally uh, get bank branches. And that was very, very successful because they coupled that with financial education at, uh, at some level as well. And the women, uh, we really like that product. It's a very, very successful product. Um, and the reason why that worked was because they were able to build an ecosystem, an ecosystem that included the women themselves, the banks, um, NGOs, and so on. And then far more importantly, the way they designed that product was from the ground up. So they did, um, uh, they call it design thinking. Um, some people call it human-centered design, the same thing. But they built that product from the ground up with the women in the room. And that's one of the things that's really lacking when people build financial services for financial access for the women. They build it at head office and then push it down to the, to the woman. And so that was an example of where that worked very, very well. Another example where this worked very well, uh, I'll give you two more countries. One of them um, was, is in Colombia, I think, somewhere in South America. And the other one was in Malaysia. The same kind of concept as well, which is build an ecosystem of providers, but leveraging the women's expertise, and, and that's how you get a very high adoption rate. So what has, so those are the examples of where it's worked very well. Um, where it hasn't worked very well is um, where you don't have this collaborative effort. And what you see happen in a lot of countries that are trying to do financial inclusion is everybody working in their own silos, right? So um, CGAP had this wonderful survey um, uh, they do it every year, but the last one was a year ago, and they they found ten million, ten billion dollars um, came into the financial inclusion space, and we still have these huge gaps, right? In in our part of Francophone Africa, for example, there isn't a single pure digital financial services 
provider, and I mean bank, right, that has a pure play digital financial services um, product. And you're not going to solve financial inclusion if you cannot have pure digital financial services, right? Because your bank's never going to be able to go into every market, every town, every village. That's just never going to happen. And so where you've seen this not work very well is when, when you don't have this ecosystem, right? Where you don't have this collaborative effort of, 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 um, of regulators, banks, mobile money providers, all coming together to solve this problem because no one um, entity or no one um, type of company can solve this problem. As good as and innovative as fintechs are, they don't have the infrastructure to solve this problem on their own in our part of the world. So they need to partner with mobile money providers, digital money providers, banks, and so on and so forth. So those are the kind of two um, examples of what works and what doesn't work. I'd love somebody else to join. And Asana, you're shaking your head. Go ahead. I hand it over to you. <laughs> No, I <laughs> thank you, Bernie. I, I think the, the what's exciting uh, about this type of market is that there's definitely room to create different models. Uh, there's potential to, to innovate and there's also uh, room to, to eliminate um, the copy and paste model. So that's the way I, I, I see it. So for example, there's a lot of financing mechanisms that we develop on the, uh, in terms of uh, GGGI to help facilitate and finance different projects. So for, I would take, um, we're, we're doing a project that has to do with access to public toilets. Not a fun topic, not a clean topic, but it's exciting <laughs> because it's part of health, right? And it's part of the, the, the environment friendly. Uh, there's a lot of challenge with going to different place, public places and getting access to toilets. And so what we're thinking is how do we come up with a model that will enable anyone to gain access to adequate toilets in public places? If the, the budget of the actual, depending on whether it's a city or, or the government as a whole, at the national level, that budget doesn't exist, let's, let's, let's create something. So with the Gates Foundation, uh, we're working on a financing mechanism where we're doing another model where we're blending finance. And this, the goal is we bring in a certain amount uh, which will be readiness uh, funding for the project. And then we will get a second part, which will then be matched by a private institution, uh, which we have, we gave the private institution to at least be launched locally. Uh, out of the 25 banks, we finished with two, which was positive, and now we have one. They will match the amount at 100%. We would then integrate that to entrepreneurs that are in Africa who need access, who are building eco-friendly toilets that are sustainable, that align with what are the green technologies that we need, and also enable any individual to go and pay to have access to those toilets at these public places. The model was designed, we got the entrepreneurs, but what is the challenge that we saw? Uh, if you're giving an entrepreneur about maybe in, in I would say maybe in dollars, uh, I would say maybe $1 million. I'm just gonna use that as an example to build toilets in one city. Uh, you wanna make sure that they're able to repay and for us to be able to, to scale that business model so that the, the number is attractive to the private investor and also uh, to the initial donor who, who launched it. So it's that innovative financing mechanism that we need to come up with and adapt it to the different projects in the different sectors. And I think Bernie touched on that um, when it came to, when you're going at a much more bigger scale than a smaller scale. And I think Maya touched on that as well in terms of South Africa, you do have it, but it's the finding, finding a tailored financing mechanism per sector is very essential. You have different currencies on the continent. Um, and then you're going from Kenyan shillings, you're going to CFA, and then you're going to, if you're like in, in, in a place like Gambia, you're going for Dallas's. Different currencies, even though we have the central bank, we still have different regulations. I think that's something that is very, very important to understand. So the moment you do that, you need to innovate the financing wheels. What a VC fund can do in Nairobi or in Kenya or in, 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 in South Africa, they might not be able to do in, in, in Francophone Africa because the rules and regulations are different. The jurisdiction is no longer based. It's going to be either in Ivory Coast it's not going to be in the UK. We do get a lot of financing from the UK because the legal framework is much more flexible in case there's litigation, but we need to look at the financing mechanisms that enable us to be sustainable, but also we need to incubate and accompany the entrepreneurs so that they know how to manage the financials, 
after year one, year two, they're finishing with certified financials. In three years, they can scale, meaning they can go outside of the continent. They can get a much bigger funding. They have the books ready. They have the discipline and the training to enable them to fly on their own. And if they do decide to fly, we need to create an ecosystem that allows them to either go for mergers, go for acquisition, or decide to, you know what, I'm going to go bigger. I think that's what we need to think about because there are different models out there, but we need to also think about five, 10 years from now, what can they do and how do we enable them, giving them the autonomy? Because the challenge I'm seeing with a lot of um, the models we see here is innovative finance is often limiting. As Bernie mentioned, you have the pre-seed, right? And I think a lot of times when we're thinking about the continent, we're focusing too much on the pre-seed and we're also focusing a lot on the seed capital. But what happens after? where the big fishes are, where the higher returns of investments are, where you, it would attract more VC funds. So I think that's, though, that's what will enable solid economic development, the inability to, to, to incubate, but also develop financing mechanisms that enable companies to thrive, enable economies to achieve models that bring in job creation and sustainable revenue and scalable business models outside of just the country, but also in neighboring countries. I will stop there <laughs> because I'm too passionate about the topic. <laughs> um, can, I, can, I, can I jump in? I actually have an inter a response to Carla who, um, and I know, you know, we have only have 10 minutes left, but um, maybe we, we can connect after this, Carla. Um, just touching on the lending side. So as we're speaking about these innovative models and structures and the gaps in the market, et cetera, what we're seeing in South Africa, and it would be interesting to see if it's the same in Senegal uh, and other regions, um, is is in the there's a particular gap in the market for short-term flexible working capital finance. That's not necessarily, you know, it's not your equity kind of finance. It's not your permanent capital investing um, model. It's more um, purchase order financing and the like. That is incredibly risky for lenders. I mean, the banks won't touch it. Um, and so you have these, these smaller lending outfits that are emerging or have emerged um, that are charging incredibly high rates. So we're seeing between um, in South Africa between two to six percent per month. So that can be as high as 60% annualized. And then all sorts of collateral requirements, um, personal sureties, red tape. So, and then the penalty is on a daily basis, accruing interest. Um, and it's just very difficult for SMEs to begin to grow their businesses if their margins are being squeezed by the fact that they need, they, they need capital. They need this particular type of capital and they're forced to, um, to, if they can access it, access it on very expensive terms. Um, and so what we did at, at a Wimvest, Carla, is we we created an instrument that is priced below market and we partnered with um, different fund managers to provide this type, this type of equity, uh, sorry, in, investment to their um, investment companies. So it's almost like venture debt and that these companies were already backed by an equity holder. And so that de-risked it for us because we're not, we weren't like a third party lender. So we could price our, our instrument below market. Um, but we were then able to deploy very, very small check sizes um, on flexible terms to, to these entrepreneurs. And so, I mean, we raised 3 million rand at, at, the, at the pooled level and deployed that, you know, in the first facility, there's several facilities, but in the first one is 3 million rand, which is, which is well, now uh, maybe like $200,000, something like that, very small, um, and deployed that to five uh, companies at a time. So these are very, very small check sizes, but incredibly catalytic in the ability for these companies to be able to, to grow over time as, as the capital is recycled because their margins are healthier. And particularly in this, um, this environment where interest rates are just going through the roof. Um, so anyway, I'll just, just wanted to add that address Carla's comment there uh, question. I may add uh, quickly, uh, Maya, that, that brought up a very good point because in, we have something called the Greenpreneurs Program in Senegal for entrepreneurs that are in the green space in different sectors. And one of the biggest thing we've noticed is that they do want that flexibility, but they, they mentioned that even if we get the financing, we need a firm that will come in between and show us how do we manage our books 
how do we make sure that we are financially literate to be able to bid for bigger financing? And how do you prepare us, right? Um, to, 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 to go for other options rather than just, do we go for an option of debt or do we go for an option of equity, right? Um, do we seek an angel investor or do we go for VC funding? So these are different options that they would like. That financial literacy is key. And if we begin to have institutions that bridge that knowledge gap, because a lot of the challenges I'm seeing, it's not access to, to competency or, or resources. I think it's mostly there's a knowledge gap and, a, and an accompaniment that's needed and not just incubation, it's more than incubation. And I think that's what's missing for a lot of the entrepreneurs we're seeing. I just wanna to add to, I just wanna just uh, refer to um, Carla's point about the group lending. So um, Carla, it's, it's a fantastic, um, um, concept. We actually launched in with an organization, a bank called Bloom Bank in Gambia, that exact um, model. They call them clusters. So the cluster a group of SMEs and they do what is called asset lending. So they don't lend to the, um, they don't lend directly to the, to the SMEs. What they do is they build a supplier network around this asset lending. And then what happens is a group of these SMEs come and say, we want to buy heavy equipment. They, they lend, they, they pay the money to the actual supplier. Uh, and then the supplier delivers the equipment to the SMEs. And then the SMEs pay back that loan to the bank. So that's one way of the bank able to reduce their risk. And at the same time, make sure that that money is well spent by the supplier, by the, um, by the uh, entrepreneur, but also able to negotiate better rates on behalf of the entrepreneur with the suppliers as well. So that is that concept of cluster that they do, that we launch in with um, Blue Bank. So it's a really good, good model. Okay, uh, great. Uh, I mean, Carla, I also have an example, but it's in the interest of time. Um, we should be wrapping up, but what I'd like to hear from um, the panelists is, with everything being said and when all the, the different instruments that are being explored and different programs and making sure there's capacity building that takes place, which is very crucial to, to improving your chances of success. Um, what should public and private stakeholders, funders, lenders, LPs look at and what should they consider? And in terms of just in, you know allowing this capital to flow to the to the right initiatives, what should, what should they be um, thinking about? What should be top of mind? And we've spoken a lot about the geographical differences and, and bearing that in mind and the needs are different and the level of, of maturity is different. Uh, we are one big continent uh, with very varying uh, requirements. Um, so I don't know who would like to go first as we're closing off. Sana? <laughs> Okay, um, I, I would say for, for what, I, what I see on the market is the risk is there, um, but the, the game changer is having a solid, a solid technical partner on the ground that can help navigate the market. Uh, when you do that, it enables you to, to reduce risk, maximize profit, and quickly identify potential solid opportunities of investments. Um, I know we're short on time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Should I have yeah, I think I, 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 Asana said everything for me. I think I, the only thing I will add to that is I think we should also look at region specific um, funding solutions um, because like Asana mentioned before, what, what's happening in Francophone Africa in Senegal is very different from what's happening in Nigeria, for example, even though we're both in West Africa. And I think we need to have funds that specialize in particular regions as well and understand the obstacles that um, that lie in each country. For us in Francophone Africa, the biggest obstacle is regulation. And we need funds who understand that, have local partners who can navigate that regulatory nightmare for them. Um, because we still need the, the, the same kind of funding resources help to be able to grow. Yeah, I completely echo what has been said. And I think the, the theme here is partnerships. Um, and I think the, the approach of a siloed approach to investments and a siloed approach to doing business is outdated. 
Uh, we're in a world where things are changing more rapidly than we can comprehend. And the more people we have at the table, whether it be through technical assistance, whether it be our platform partners, whether it be on the regulatory government side, whether it be on the investment side, blended finance, all of that plays a role and increases your, your ability to have both you know, achieve whatever financial uh, objective you're trying to achieve, as well as the impact objective uh, together. So, so for me, partnerships would be would be a key one. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Kim, I don't know if you'd like to just uh, uh, share some closing words regarding, you know, future conversations and um, to dive deeper if there are any other interesting areas that one would like to explore. Um, I mean, I think I'm not going to rephrase what you all said very well. A lot of interesting insights on uh, like the fact that uh, we shouldn't talk about Africa as just one big block um, and also looking at capacity building, uh, like comprehensive solution partnerships. I think a lot of very interesting insights. So we'd be happy to, if some of the uh, panelists or some of the um, participants to the discussion are, have ideas about subsequent uh, focus that we should have events to freely reach out to us. Um, this was a panel, but we can accommodate other formats like workshops where we try to deep dive on one specific ideas. Uh, and again, uh, if some of you uh, are willing to maybe get in touch in, with the panelists, if you don't uh, have their LinkedIn accounts, we're, we're happy to eventually uh, facilitate uh, uh, getting in touch. That being said, a huge thank you to uh, Bernie, Sibon Guillet, Maya, and Asana for, for joining us today. Again, very interesting perspectives from uh, uh, your respective angles and the different areas you fo focus on. I think it was uh, very, very um, educational and uh, inspiring as well. So. A huge thanks to all of you, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers.